Estoy Buenos días, good morning. El Sarbaño Leen, Milla Esquer, Torquis Unareikis, Congreso Bonetara, Va Urbildu Sarete. Good morning and to everybody that's decided to come to this event, the Etorkesuna Arraikis, and for having decided to choose our panel. I'm sure that you won't regret that because it's going to be really interesting. The next uh, minutes, we're going to be talking about the future, but also, and above all, about the transition. And with your permission, before dealing with these subjects, I would like to just uh, take a look backwards and look to five years back, because that was when we decided to set up the Atorkisuna Raikis project. At that time, it was just a very pleasant dream. But with this project, what we were aiming to do was to design our future. We wanted to uh, detect what challenges were out there and encouraging people to experiment and find s solutions to these challenges. Back then, I said it was just a dream, but five years have gone past since then. And so what we're going to be telling you about today here are the results of that idea we had uh, five years ago, at least part of them. So. So we've got Gipuzkoa Lab, a lab which encourages experimenting and as our provincial governor said, has already got 32 products, projects up and running in the social area and some of them are already achieving results. We've got Arimberi, which is uh, one of our benchmark centres, Arimberi, and also our think tank. And we're lucky to be able today to talk about the results of the work that's been done. So to talk about the future and also to talk about transitions, we have to be clear. We need to talk about transitions. We can't talk about the future without talking about transition because today we're going to be building this future what we do today is going to influence directly the future so this uh, path which we're going to follow for the future we need to set out today and what steps we're going to take that's why we talk about transitions that's what we mean by transitions it's important what we do but it's important as what we do is how we go about things. And at the provincial uh, council of Gipuzkoa, we're clear about how we want to go about things. In collaboration, we want to encourage a transition, social, solities, so, so, social policies that are based on innovation and experimentation. We want to be a province that guarantees the rights of uh, the most vulnerable. How do we do that? Well, uh, offering prevention, residences, home help, getting the community involved and uh, volunteers as well, amongst, of course, many others. And together with all of that, we also want to create spaces for social experimentation, care, local care ecosystems. And to build all of that, we've got to very useful tool, which is our think tank. Our think tank uh, has four groups uh, inside. I think you already know that. And the futures of the well, the futures of the welfare state is the one that's concerned about social policies. And tomorrow, between today and tomorrow, we'll be hearing about what the think tank says in this regard. Once again. In Spanish now, we're going to be talking in the next few minutes about the challenges of transition and the challenges that we are facing when we talk about different care models. 
we debate everything that we do a great deal and the title of uh, this working group is also something that we've debated quite heatedly. Why have we entitled our group the futures of the welfare state? Well, there are many ways of defining the welfare state, many ways of approaching it. So that's why we want to work in the future of the welfare state. And the think tank feels that the key to welfare state is social cohesion. That means the greater the welfare state, the larger the welfare state, the greater the level of social cohesion. That's how we work on things. That's one of our key uh, ga goals. So the future of uh, welfare is very closely linked to the future of social policy. And, and it's not just one future, it's futures. That's why we use that as a plural noun. And it's through this plurality that it's really important to decide and choose which path we're going to follow to bring about this transition. To innovate what we're going to, what kind of experimentation we're going to put into practice to achieve one kind of result or other. What are the changes, the great uh, main challenges of uh, social policies? Well, firstly, the demographic transition, of course. The complete uh, change about of the populational uh, pyramid. This is uh, the aging of the population is something really, really, which is a, a, a challenge. The um, thicker part of the pyramid is growing in size and we need to respond to this pyramid uh, effectively and we need to improve the people's uh, quality of life. Figures are clear on that by 2032 46% of the people in Gipuzko will be over 65 the second of that challenge is our need to get a better care model this is something that we've also debated a great deal in our think tank because it's not only do we need to deal with the aging challenge but there are other groups of people other communities that require specialist care and this has to go hand in hand with what we offer to uh, the demographic group but also there are other groups as well so it's something that affects everybody we need to get a more modern uh, care model we'll be talking about that and the third of our challenges, and sometimes it's difficult to talk about, it's like the elephant right in the middle of the room, which is the sustainability of social services. Society is changing. There's uh, far more needs. The funding of uh, social services is uh, increasing, or we need it to increase. And we need to transit towards a care model that is uh, far more personalized and if we do that it's probably not going to be uh, cheaper we need to remember that and we also need to see how demographic pressure how are we going to if there's so much demographic pressure reach the uh, a balance that we need financial balance so those are the challenges that we set out and there's a very, very complex uh, scenario, at least at the outset. What is the main goal, the main goal of our think tank? Well, none other than to create a space, a trusting space where we can come again together, where we can think out loud, where we can experiment, and at the end of the day, design together these transitional social policies. And you can't just experiment and, and deliberate and think any old how. No, you have to do it in a structured form, which is based on four uh, processes. Firstly, 
a shared structuring of problems. First of all, we need to know what the problems are. We have to agree upon uh, those problems. A design of future and change scenario, experimenting and innovation as mechanisms to make progress, and policy design for this transition. What is the path that we're going to choose to actually achieve this goal of a change in our care model. That's actually the ultimate uh, goal of a think tank, a safe place uh, where people can uh, trust each other, they can cooperate and coordinate to design uh, transition social policies. So just briefly now, we're going to be talking about the methodology that we use in our think tank. I'm not going to explain the whole of the methodology, but I'm going to talk about four keys to this process. The think tank uh, has 28 people uh, as its members. They're people that are experts in social policy or people that are in charge of social policy or uh, resource managers. We've carried, we've held 12 sessions and during those 12 sessions, we've set out our challenges for a new uh, care model. We've actually classified these challenges as well and we've debated what policy options are there. And as you can imagine, debates have been very, very intense, shall we say. Um, we've prepared a series of recommendations that have emerged from these debates. The next step is going to design these transitional social policies. So we've prepared our challenges. We know what the challenge is there. And to deal with these challenges, we've prepared a, a formula uh, to look about how these challenges are going to be uh, dealt with. And then uh, processes have been drawn from them. Of these processes, we'll, we've drawn two uh, products. One is the white paper of social policy in Gipuzkoa. I'll be talking about that later on in my next talk. And also a manual for personalizing care. And um, Ben Arion will be talking about that. We've also created a further 12 uh, working documents within our think tank. It's really important also to see the policies that we're working on, who are they aimed at? For example, people mm, that are dependent, f the fragile, the vulnerable, those that are socially excluded, women who are victims of male violence, and their children, and also uh, children who are at risk and without forgetting those people that are members of the disabled community. It's important to know what social groups our social policies are aimed at so that we know what the best model, what the new model can be aimed at these groups. At the end of today's session, Carlos Alfonso will talk about social policies for transition in Gipuzkoa. Here are the main results that we've obtained. He'll be talking about that, them as well. And they're a result of a great deal of work. Those are the ones that we've got so far. Firstly, the white paper entitled Gipuzkoa 2030, the future of care in social policy. I'm not going to talk about it because we will be talking about it later. But what this white paper is, is something that aims to contribute to uh, these uh, social policies, transitional social policies. They talk about the challenges of social service systems, and these challenges have been uh, decided upon in collaborative fashion. And they also drop a whole series of recommendations which will facilitate transition to a new care model for Gipuzkoa. I think this is uh, something very, very specific, of course. And then this manual for personalizing social services in Gipuzkoa. It aims to contribute to develop 
organizational formula which make these uh, transition processes of social services possible here in this province and a more uh, tailored um, model. This is something that we hadn't originally thought of as part of our think tank, but we've seen that there is this need to look closer in this area of tailoring. In fact, a specific working group has been set up to work in depth on the idea of personalizing or tailoring these care services They've given us ideas about how we can get down to grassroots, use organizational formula and transit towards this new care model at the way at the same time as facing up to the challenges that are uh, highlighted by the white paper. So now we've defined our challenges and next Carlos Alfonso will give us the context of this work and then Belen Larion will give us the manual, will talk to us about the manual. And then Javier Castro at the end will talk to us about future projects and will look more at experimenting and assessing. And at the end of this morning, there'll be a short time so that we can debate about these issues and Put out some uh, conclusions. Assessment is a, a really important tool for us. Uh, of course it is. Well, leave it there. This is the first part of what I had to say. And I'm going to hand the floor over to Carlos Alfonso. Thank you very much. and welcome to, to Gipuzkoa. This morning, we will try to explain to you, especially for those of you that have come from outside our province, how or what sort of future we want to achieve in a state of, in the welfare state and a care state. How can we change our province to achieve that goal so that you know that we're working on it? We're going to, first of all, it deal with two uh, subjects. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the institutional context in general, in general. And in the second part, the second issue that I'm going to be talking about is the path that we're going to follow towards the new uh, 2030 agenda, this, this um, itinerary that we've uh, set up. But let's talk t first about the institutional setup here. You've got some figures on the screen so you can see a little bit more about what our province, Kipuzkoa, uh, is like. You probably already know, some of us, uh, some of you about where we are. What's most important is to tell you that it's a very small mm, province, but a great density of population. The population here for Kipuzkoa is 727,000, uh, scattered around different uh, towns. Economically, Industry is the main activity in our province, and our GDP is 33,161 euros per capita per year. The Basque Autonomous Region is divided up into three provinces, Alava, Kipuzkoa and Bizkaya. These three provinces uh, share the same language and the same culture. And we're very, very proud of that fact. 
and thanks to the provincial setup that exists, the provincial governments have powers over each province. And then there are different administrative and government institutions that can implement them. We've got the legislature and also the executive power. That's thanks to the uh, rights that we have here. So the provincial government has a series of powers. It covers a series of remit. We can say that in the Basque Country, in comparison to other provinces around and regions around Spain, we have more power. I'm going to give you some information now about social services. In Spain, social services are decentralized. We have 17 autonomous communities or regions, and they have their own social services law. If we go back now to the Basque Autonomous Region, we have a specific law which says that city councils are the ones to manage primary care services, and the provincial council as well. We all need to go to the city council if we want to benefit to these different services. And uh, let me now explain which is the institutional context so that you can understand and so that you can know about the organization within the social department. The social department in Gipuzkoa, 450,000 euros, that is the budget. Half of the total budget of the Provincial Council Social Services Department attends to 29,000 uh, people per year, people having different needs, which represents 4% of the population. On the other hand, in the different centers that we have in the province in Gipuzkoa, 11,000 of them belong to the Diputación, to the Provincial Council, and you know half of them are for the dependent elderly. Then there are two specificities, and on the one hand, on the one hand, we have a level of concentration, which is quite important in terms of population, and on the other hand, third sector social institutions or entities are managed through the Provincial Council. So I hope that now you have an idea about our context, and I hope that now you know a bit more about our territory and how it works. And now let me tell you about the pathway defined that we have been defining so that you can know which have been the steps made and so that you can also know about the background that we will be developing all through this morning. We could have started before, but I wanted to show you this pathway tragic with many different bends and turns, but full of challenges and opportunities as well. And I have identified 10 milestones. There are more, but I have selected 10 so that you can know the different stages and the different steps that we have been making in this territory, in the province of Gipuzkoa. I hope that you won't get lost. First milestone. This is the first milestone. There was this request being made. We participated in Europe in this European call. And uh, you know, we were not granted the subsidy, but it was the very first time, as many of you know, that we came together in coordination. We, the goal was not just to get the subsidy, but the goal was to join our efforts in terms of innovation and social experimentation. The moment had come to join our hands and our forces. And it was the very first time at which we started talking about Gipuzkoa as a province where care plays an essential role. So that was the project for the year 2020-2030. And for the very first time, 
we started talking about this care land 2020-2013. And we realized that uh, we are a small province, but far from being a disadvantage in terms of innovation and social experimentation, that could be an advantage. Because it is true that we have the institutions and we have this care provision strategy and we realized that that was a an advantage, and that it was going to be much, much easier to start working around pilot projects on this small basis, at this level. So that was the beginning, that was the starting point, that was the first milestone. Second milestone now. In November in 2019, the strategic plan 2020-2030 was approved as Mr. Marke Lolano. Back then, we decided that we wanted to fight against inequalities and to be leaders in Europe. And in terms of social policies, that was a very clear goal, a very clear objective, the goal of which was to foster new formulae, focusing on taking care of people's needs and the community back then, in November 2019, that was already a very clear trend. In March 2020, as you all know, crisis, the pandemic arrived, and back then, as you remember, we had those different forecasts for the future, and it is true that then we have been having different waves. We thought that everything would be over by December 2021. And that was not the case. But in Gipuzkoa, just as elsewhere in the world, we have been living a very tragic, a very difficult situation, even tragic. The pandemic deepened this the problems within the system. But once again, we decided to take advantage of this situation, to try and accelerate our goals, to try and accelerate our actions. And we decided to take advantage of the crisis. And once again, to be proactive and try and transform the situation. That is why directly in the month of March 2020, we presented our plan to try and fight against the COVID-19 with different action lines. The goal was to inform, to prevent, to contain, maintain and strengthen the population. And that is what we started doing already back then. A few months later, in June, just as Maite has just said, we organized the first uh, meeting in our think tank to speak about the futures of our welfare state. And Maite has already spoken about it. It's true that from the very beginning, at that point, I didn't think that this group would end up being as influential as it is. I don't know if you agree with me, but uh, yes, it is true that back then we didn't think that it would end up being as important as it is in terms of our public policies. And uh, thank you very much to all of you for having made it possible. In October 2020, last year, between one wave and the other, we introduced, we requested and we introduced um, an evaluation. We wanted to assess the impact of the crisis and to be able to reflect, reflect on the crisis in Gipuzkoa. 25 different measures were launched and we also learned a lot because we this assessment was made after asking questions to people. We went to the users, to family members, to professionals, to workers, and we wanted to carry out that survey. We learned a lot. If we had to sum up all the different lessons, people said that we had to change. We could not keep on doing things in the same way. 
That's right, we needed to change that perspective and that was the most important lesson for me. The lesson that we have uh, tried to implement all through this process. And before the end of the year, the Provincial Council, taking into account the situation, we decided to adapt the initial plan, this initial strategic plan for the term. We decided to refocus or to improve our objectives, the goal being fighting against pandemic without leaving anybody out, anybody behind. And we reached 2021, and in the month of March, the legislative institution here in Gipuzkoa decided to come to us, to the Provincial Council, and they asked us to draft a plan which would take into account all the results in this assessment, in the survey I just referred to. And that is what we did. This plan is part of the Agenda 2030, which is the last milestone that I will be telling you about later on. October 2021, as Cynthia said before, within the Recovery and Re Resilience Plan, we decided to sign a contract. 34 million euros were going to be given to us so as to be able to move forward within this transition going towards this new model of care. Two main action lines were identified. First, we wanted to have public equipment and to improve what we had, all that based upon a new architecture based on people and based on the community. And second, these funds were aimed at innovation projects which were already being implemented. And it is true that uh, even if in the past we had no European financing, we could start working. And this became one of the pilot projects that later on were able to benefit from these European funds. Next milestone, today, 13th of December. 2021, we are going to be sharing with you the white paper, the white paper, which is the result of the think tank. And last but not least, and maybe I am cheating a little bit because I don't know if this is being cooked, if it is in the microwave or in the oven, but we are going to introduce it later on this month, I would like to tell you about the Gipuzkoa 2030 Agenda. That is the agenda where we have included all the recommendations coming from the white paper and the personalization guide, as well as all the contributions made by citizens. It consists of, or it has four main goals, the first one implies defining this new way of acting, of implementing things for the next 10 years to come until the year 2030. Next, we also want to develop a framework for collaborative governance, where we want to guarantee the involvement of users, their participation. Third, we also want to design and foster a framework so as to promote innovation and inno experimentation and innovation in Gipuzkoa. And last, we want to design a new participatory model that we will be talking about later on as well. Maybe the most important innovation, the main innovation in this agenda is that, as Maite said before, we link social policies with transitional or transition policies, understanding that we are talking about programs, actions, which are going to be favoring transition to go from a model based upon services to go towards a new model based upon 
people's citizens' needs. And that cannot be done just like that, even if we are a small province. It requires and it needs time. So we think that maybe it will take us at least for 10 years. That is the forecast. And right now, today, we have three action plans being implemented. And we realized that maybe the traditional design model was not good any longer and that we had to be innovative because we had a strategic plan from the provincial council, then the COVID plan with its measures, then the strategy, the innovation Ikerland strategy. And once again, we realized that right now, at this moment, there are three dimensions in social policies three different dimensions. On the one hand, we had the contingencies agenda, everything linked to COVID, which implies being able to adopt measures very quickly. We also had the stabilization agenda linked to improving our quality of living with midterm decisions all those included within the strategic plan. And last, we had a transition agenda linked to innovation, where we already spoke about long-term measures aimed at the transformation of the model. And what the Agenda 2030 does is that it integrates and brings together those three elements into one single agenda. And in terms of planning, that is a great present. It was a great present for me. So within this agenda, we have an action plan. The action plan for the year 21-23 with 11 axes, almost 80 specific actions. We also include the importance of um, gender equality, the use of Basque language. There is a specific budget, some of the actions are already there because they were urgent, they are already being implemented, and there are different indicators to try and assess the evolution and to see if we are reaching the goals or not. We do not have the time to speak about them in depth, but let me tell you about the action axis divided into the different dimensions. Contingencies, three axes, support to social health management, also trying to reply to social needs, stability to improve the well-being of users, digitization, if we speak about the innovation agenda for access, design and development of the transition agenda. Number 10, maybe the most important one for me, the importance of developing a new care model, which will go land in land with our goal, because within this model, it is there where we are going to be defining the model. And we want it to be people-oriented, citizens-oriented, tailored, a model that supports community care approaches, cross-cutting, all through our life and for me that is the most important thing and we also wanted to develop uh, an assessment model or an evaluation model and we have already started working these have been the most important milestones and even if I didn't mention it before, it is true that the Puzqua is a province where we have many mountains, we love nature, and uh, we are climbers, and we enjoy nature, have our own pathway, we are ready, we have a very important team working day and night, willing to work. It is true that there are different um, roadmaps which are very specific 
And it is true that all through these days, today and tomorrow, we're going to have the chance to show you that roadmap. So, once again, we are not at the top, but it is true that uh, we are on the way. All the necessary components are there so as to be able to make this happen. We want to become a province where care is provided in the best way. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor again to Maite Peña. Thank you very much. Good morning again. Yes, we have been putting things into context. Thank you, Carlos. It is true that we have been living these recent years with loads of intensity. And those of us who are here in this world, sometimes we tend to forget about it. And when you see one milestone after the other, it is true that uh, it is quite impressive. So yes, thank you very much. It has helped us understand the everything that has been done and which explains where we are today, introducing this white paper. Carlos has been sharing with us which are those ingredients that have made it possible for all of us to be here today talking about this white paper. She continues into Basque. White paper establishes the context for social policies in the future. And it offers us, it gives us the tools, the tools so as to be able to move forward and reach that new care model. It is essential to try and build a society based upon solidarity, shared values, the individual and intergenerational engagement and the will to reach the common welfare. The contents of the white paper. First of all, I would like to say thank you to all the members of the think tank and all the members of the people who in one way or another have made it possible, have made it possible for us to have these documents in the think tank. I will be telling you about them later on. But I would also like to say thank you to all the experts who are here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having shared with us your time. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your contributions that have been essential. A cornerstone. And once again, essential to be able to develop this white paper. The purpose, the main objective of this white paper is to move from the system we have and to go towards a new care and support model. Sometimes it is true that these different expressions, new concepts, this new model, it, uh, you know, it speaks about many different things. And we wanted to be specific. We wanted to agree upon and share and know exactly what is the new model we want to obtain. Are we all talking about the same thing? As Carlos said before, it's true that it was only evident, only clear that we had to start doing things in a different way. 
that was evident after carrying out the assessment. But do we agree? Do we know exactly what are we talking about? So we have been defining all those different elements which are essential in this model so that all of us can share and can know exactly what are we speaking about. So it is based upon the transitional theory applied on this model. Tailoring, personalization understood for this whole network with people and citizens being in the center, in the focus with their demands, with their needs and also with their relationships. People, citizens in the heart, in the center. That is essential. Participation. Engagement has to be active, with an active engagement from these people and also from this support network. We are not speaking on an individual basis because each individual is considered also together with his and her own context. We also need to structure leadership. Leadership is essential. As we said before, we all knew and we all agreed that we needed to move forward, but we needed leadership. And what was the leadership? We proposed relational leadership, being able to integrate professional, professionals, experts, users, so as to be able to generate consensus, strategic consensus, and mainly to be able to generate and to create trust areas, trust spaces. And that had to be done in the long run, in the long term. We needed to create and to generate this relational leadership that I have just defined, where we can generate and create these trust spaces. And experimentation here plays an essential role. Experimentation is essential within our whole project in Etorkis Unairaikis. We need to experiment so as to test new ideas, new methods, new services. We need to experiment and to test. But then, of course, this will have to be expanded and implemented. It is true that sometimes we can obtain good results, but the most important thing is that then we need to put that into practice. If not, we will be generating frustration. Through experimentation, we'll be able to foster innovation. Alas, we need to evaluate, we need to assess. That is also essential. When we talk about social services, we need to assess what we are doing. But we need to have a clear perspective. We need to be able to assess this transition, the transition being made, having this future perspective, being able to anticipate the negative effects, being able to monitor the social impact, and being able to monitor the perspective of this quality of living. Javier will be talking about this later on. I think that Javier, who is sitting there, he will be sharing with us in detail what are we doing from this perspective. So these are the five most important elements within this white paper. And there are six steps to be made. First of all, the first step consisted in organizing 12 deliberation sessions. Then we, out of these um, 12 sessions, we obtained the first ver version established by the members of the think tank. This version was internally validated. All the contributions or the individual contributions were taken into account. And we generated a second version, which had an external evaluation. In this case, we are 28 members within the think tank, but if there is something essential in our social policies in Gipuzkoa is the strength that the whole network has. And this had to be compared, shared with the whole 
network including trade unions, company owners, companies linked to the threat sector, to the care sector, users, communities. And that is what we did. We explained it to all these different groups and members, and that was essential to come up with the final version that we are going to be introducing today. And if we want to establish a first diagnosis, I invite you to go back to the essential challenges or the first challenges identified by the think tank, which have been shared with all the members of the network. And they all coincide to say that uh, these are the most important ones. If we had to put it into context, and Carlos said that quite clearly, we're talking about updating uh, problems after the COVID impact, after having gone through the COVID filter in all the different areas, not just in the healthcare field, but including the healthcare field, of course. We'll go through them quite briefly. Otherwise, today's session will never end. The first is collaborative governance and the need to make progress in health coordination, healthcare coordination. And all of you who work in the healthcare sector, uh, something that you mention almost always after the first five minutes of any meeting that you have, you tell us that for example, in those with, uh, that work in the mental health care sector, those that work in the child care sector, want coordination with other systems. And what they believe is key here is that there especially needs to be uh, coordination in the health care sector. And then in the area of care, you feel that there's this clear need to encourage people to choose uh, and, and tell them that they can choose the way they want to receive their services or maybe they don't not interested in any uh, services. The third is the need to encourage at-home care. In that way, creating a new model for at-home uh, cares uh, like the cross-cutting elements that we mentioned earlier. This doesn't mean to say that we just should be concentrating all our efforts on the creation of a new at-home uh, care model because there are some people that can't remain at home. Um, they're going to need uh, to go to a, uh, a nursing home or a home. So, of course, there needs to be this new model in care homes too. But, of course, it is true that it's been concluded that there is a challenge out there. One of the challenges is to strengthen at-home care. Then experimentation as a way of supporting innovation. If something needs to be done, if something needs to be done differently, how do we go about it? How can we start experimenting so that innovation emerges and so that we can then upscale innovation policies? And something else that is... Uh, led to uh, a great deal of support, which is training. Training is a way of supporting this new model, looking into the um, skills um, and the number of people that work in this area. We want to care and we need people to be trained, educated in the way they care for others in a different way. This is something else. Of course, digital transformation, which is key both in social services and in the third sector. Cynthia spoke a little bit about this this morning. Sustainability. We shouldn't forget that... All of this requires us to rethink and put onto the table the current funding means. And something which I sometimes repeat time and time again, and people call, accuse me of that, is assessment. We need to assess everything, everything that we do systematically, not just because it's an experimental pro uh, program. No, no, let's assess everything that we do from a... Uh, the the viewpoint of the impact and participation levels, for example. In the previous presentation that I made, I already highlighted what our target 
groups were, which our target groups were of for the white uh, paper and the work that we're doing in the Tink Thank. And th those are the target groups. I'm not going to repeat them. But as I, uh, as I said, there's a, a risk that the think tank and that the white paper tend to uh, just concentrate on the elderly because they, of course, uh, pressurize the system. But I think actually what we've been successful about is that the goal, the ultimate target groups are not just to the elderly. Of course not. All of these groups, all of the groups that you can see on the screen are also part of our target groups. I think the white paper quite rightly deals uh, with the, all of these groups from a very broad perspective. Those are the challenges. Here are the recommendations. What are the 12 recommendations to uh, transit towards a new uh, care model in Gipuzkoa? This idea of support and care should no longer be support and care uh, and, and just uh, support. It should be something that is covered in all our areas. Firstly, the conceptual uh, focus needs to be defined. This is something that I mentioned earlier. What is our conceptual model? What is this operational model if we're going to transit to a different care model? What are we referring to when we talk about uh, lifelong care, self-determination, determination, participation, uh, home care? What do we mean by that? And then, of course, care uh, personalization, care uh, customization is another important thing for our model. We shouldn't forget that customization will actually encourage uh, greater diversification. The third is uh, uh, regarding home care, a comprehensive model for home care, uh, pro encouraging pilot projects and also encouraging people to be able to stay at home and have this home care uh, system at all levels. And even though our priority is that care be at home, we shouldn't forget that there are many residences that look after many, many people in different fields. And here, we need to remember that progress needs to be made, of course. What should these uh, residences, these centers uh, have? What sort of characteristics should they have if they're going to offer this kind of care, this kind of support? What should they look like? So that the people that are in specialist residential care receive uh, the right quality care that they're entitled to. That's why social innovation, technological innovation is key. Also within institutions, if we're going to head for a new model change. As I said earlier, we shouldn't lose sight of the ultimate goal of deinstitutionalization, which is getting people out of residential care. Moving on now. There's the recommendation of local care ecosystems via collaborative governance and in connection with uh, social services, health services, uh, community services, and uh, offering uh, proximity care, and so that there's greater local and community uh, engagement. Digital transformation of social services is a, and the third sector is another recommendation, as is Education in new care uh, models. When I say education or training, this is key. That is, what sort of uh, education or training should those that work in care have so that they can offer new these new care models? They also need, of course, technological training, and they also need to be able to manage local eco uh, systems m these care ecosystems it's a paradigm shift a complete paradigm shift and finally or eighth sorry the 
improvement of working condition of uh, these carers and an improvement in these quality ratios. A lot has been said in Gibutka uh, recently in about the working conditions of those that work in care homes, but we're not just referring to that. There's no doubt that it, the care sector is an increasing uh, area where employment will be fine, especially in Gibutka with the aging of this population. What we want is those carers be trained that they have good working conditions. Of course, everybody that offers uh, care to the different target publics that we've mentioned, those that work in home care, those that work informally, and those that work in residential situations. And in the care sector, of course, they need professional, uh, dignified uh, working conditions that makes the, this, this kind of employment attractive to them. It's also been a recommendation to design and uh, implement these programs, community programs. We think that this will help us transit towards an alternative, more customized, more individualized model of care and support, strengthen social and collaborative governance. It's complicated. All of these recommendations are complicated. It's complicated uh, implementing open government when in the Basque country the institutional framework is so complex. And that requires collaborative and social governance, a kind of uh, governance which is developed upon... Uh, resource provisions, leadership, and these, what we call reflection for or deliberation for. COVID-19 has taught us one thing, which is we need to improve the ability, the ability of our social uh, system to be resilient, resilient, to be able to face up to social emergency systems. Who would have thought when we were planning this, uh, perhaps five years ago, that by almost uh, uh, the year 2022, we'd be in the next of many, many waves of uh, COVID. So we need to improve our resilience, our ability to be resilient. To do that, it's necessary to have intersectorial coordinated uh, committees, just one stop shop so that everybody is coordinated when you go to uh, one place. And finally, it's recommended that a provincial uh, system be uh, set up to assess care, assess uh, the economic uh, sustainability of the whole system using an indicator based system. So that's in summary, in short, the work that the think tanks have been on, as it were, and that it, it can just be boiled down into these 12 recommendations. But what about now? What's happening now? We've got our recommendations. Now, what we have to do is to integrate all these recommendations and to face up to the challenges inside our social policy. As Carlos said, all of this work is going to have a tremendous effect on the way social policies are designed. In fact, far more than you might think originally. And in this slide, you can see how we've made the connection. And then you can see the overlap between the white paper and our 2030 Gipuzko agenda. The main role of the think tank is, of course, to design these transitional policies. And our department, what it, that has to do is to provide the necessary resources and the necessary support so that all of this can be put into practice. These are 38 uh, local actions that are closely linked to the recommendations made directly related, of course, to these recommendations, all 38 of them. 
And with this project, what we aim to do is to set up also a project that monitors to what extent the recommendations from the white paper really implemented into our department's social policies. We're not just doing this work to carry on reflecting ad infinitum. No, we're doing this work to try to set the pace, design a path for future social policy. And this goal of ongoing assessment will also tell us to what extent these uh, are being implemented. We created our 2030 agenda to also drive really forward these transitional uh, policies. And what we want to do through all of this is to put Kiputhkwa at uh, the cutting edge of care and do it in a shared fashion trying to strengthen social policy and not just strengthen the many old how or anywhere, but no, following, sticking to the recommendations that have been made and that have been shared. To conclude, what are the key five impacts that we have drawn from this white paper? They've all been dated and that dates 2023. And that's just not something that has been uh, picked by chance, but it's because 2023, the current government's period office comes to an end. So despite the fact that the roadmap has designed right up to 2030, the funding uh, is there is in place until 2023. The first impact is to have driven forward this idea of personalization of care via setting up this manual for customization, both at home and both in residential care, based on itineraries uh, according to um, profiles, plans, and uh, strengthening the digitization and monitoring of personalized care processes. Impact two is having strengthened the development of local care ecosystems here of course it's we need to strengthen once again collaborative governance we should uh, drive forward uh, personalized care itinerary uh, there needs to be a management of cases and of course systemic assessment systemic evaluation of the impact of this improvement on quality of life the next impact is having a driven forward experimentation to facilitate an incremental innovation of this model and of uh, care. The development of experimental projects is something, that, of course, that we've been testing and doing for years to test ideas, products and key services to uh, move forward in this transition towards the, uh, this new care model. What we want is social participation and as uh, evaluation. Quite clearly, we need to experiment. We need to innovate. The resources that uh, are attached to current regulations. We need to go beyond them and we need to take a giant step forward, a giant leap forward, do it safely, do it surely. That's what we're trying to do and uh, concentrate on uh, experimentation, training, training and skilling, upskilling of new uh, care models. We've spoken about that earlier. And in addition, there's this possibility of setting up care cooperatives and developing talent for this uh, transition, which we feel is key. The other day, the mayor pointed out, spoke about this strategic plan. I was in the presentation and they were saying, you know, we don't want to attract talent. No, we need to be somewhere where there's talent stays what we want is the current talent not to leave us because there are many many of you know the professional situation what some uh, groups are in the fifth impact is having carried out a systemic uh, evaluation of these um, transition social policies. I'm not going to repeat this because I know Javier is going to be talking about this. But this is key. We need to know and to be able to understand 
to document the changes that are in this model so as to be able to take decisions indicator-based evaluation or indicator-based assessment, participatory assessment are key for uh, this. This needs to be evidence-based. And so a network of assessment throughout our province, which is based on different uh, hubs, needs to be created. So I'd say that our goals are clear. They're shared. I think we know the um, path that we want to take. And I'd say that we've got a very powerful, broad network supporting all of this uh, initial work that's behind all of this initial work and that we're sharing with you today. This is what makes it possible to face these challenges. And at least... Even within this time of a pandemic, with a great deal of optimism, Carlos is far more poetic than I am. For me, what's really, really important is to know where we're heading. The speed at which you travel down the path that we've set ourselves, you uh, but and you've got to get through different stages. And sometimes it's very encouraging when you get through different stages. But at least if you know which path to follow, if you know who are your allies on this path, everything looks far more optimistic and everything is stronger. On the Etorquesuna Raikis website, just to close, you can find our white paper, you can download it. This is uh, uh, the official presentation from now on. It's today on what it's um, public. It's a tough road ahead, a very steep road ahead as well. But it's a very hopeful road ahead. And we're going to have a good company along the way. So thank you. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs>
We needed first to set out a series of common concepts. That was one of our goals. A little later on, I'll explain how we went about that uh, exercise that we organized to do that. It was really, really interesting. Then we needed a, a manual to be able to define uh, contents and implications. Thirdly, we needed to pinpoint those uh, tools that could help us put it into operation. And fourthly, we thought it would be a good idea to describe a series of best practices, which we thought would be helpful for the future. How did we go about that? How did we write? Etorque es una like is actually in in its own right is a good example of this and just as important as what we've done is how we've done it. What procedure did we follow to write this manual? By the way, all of this has been the result of teamwork. There are around 10 uh, representatives working in the field of social services in Gibraltar and that work on these in these think tanks uh, on the future of welfare and all of them were in this uh, team effort so who were those people there you've got the name of the different uh, organizations, but I'd like to give the names of the people that are behind them, the behind these organizations. Bacarne, Chavaria, Inigo, Cortavitate, Javi Chancho, Javi Castro, Spida, Yosu Gabo, Manu Munoz, Mikel Corbanan, Penelope uh, Castajon, and Tony Heredia. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of you. It's been an enormous pleasure having worked with you, and I really do ho hope. And I'm sure, actually, that we will be carrying on working together and uh, drilling down in uh, to the depths of our work. It's all been po made possible thanks to the work of and the support of the CIS technical uh, office. So thanks to the people that work there for their support. I said that we did an initial exercise on customization or personalization. And this was e an exercise which required us to think about customization. What actually is customization for us? And it's not an easy thing to think about. And here you can see on the screen 10 indicators which we considered when preparing our customization guide and then we decided what what customization was and what it wasn't so you need to know what it is and what it isn't these uh, give you an idea of the different areas that we focused on what's up on the screen including how we set up a assistance plan how do you go through all that process how you uh, work with integrity, how you define professionals, and of course, um, any prospection that needs to be carried out, research that needs to be carried out. There are four main sections to our manual. We've already spoken about this uh, map of concepts that we all agreed upon, that, but we also Required some recommendations to be put into the manual as well as how we could prepare the customization in Gipuzkoa or the care system in Gipuzkoa because we had to decide what tools were there to personalize this customization. We wanted to, in Gipuzkoa, decide upon what could be done in Gibraltar because there are many, many activities in Gibraltar. So we organized an activity to be able to pinpoint them. And we received three main contributions, and I'd like to highlight them. The 
firstly, and this is something that uh, is applicable to all of those people that work in social services, we've already spoken about the aged, the disabled, etc. And it's also a customization for everybody, everybody in all the different groups in Gibraltar. But we want to go beyond that in second place. It's not just uh, direct primary care. It's a Beyond that, there's a, there's a major, major challenge which has three sides to it, both macro and micro sides to it, which you need to take into considering the different uh, paradigms and viewpoints that are all uh, contained under the same umbrella. And thirdly, in this uh, road towards customization, we had to take into account different proposals different proposals linked to the white paper and the Agenda 2013. So, this is our guide. Customization is essential in social services in Guipúzcoa. We have identified 10 models that we have taken into account, 10 models or 10 references, which are benchmarks in social services. And they come from the world of gerontology, of aged people, disabilities. They are the ones who have been studied these issues more in more depth. So the model of independent living and planning focusing on people, the model of quality of living and the care model, as well as the gerontologic care, are the models that have been most widely developed. We have also looked at Anglo-Saxon models such as direct pay and individual budgets and other models that we are already implementing in Gipuzkoa in terms of care given to social exclusion, such as models aimed at reducing damages and support. Child care and adolescent care. In this sense, of course, I would like to speak about the superior interest of minors and the theory of link and attachment to try and develop and implement better services, customized services. We are also working in terms of transition towards adulthood, and that is what has been reflected also in the guide. On the other hand, we have also taken into account the organizational dimensions that we need to bear in mind when thinking in terms of customizing social services. As said before, this, only, this does not only imply changes at the micro level, but also the meso and the macro level. The organization, by and large, in the whole system, it's to bear in mind this customization. If that is not the case, we will have a negative effect. We have also highlighted nine different aspects which should be borne in mind. As you can see, the services catalog, which is wide enough and diverse enough so as to be able to give the possibility of choice and being able to guarantee the continuity of care, always taking into account the evolution in terms of needs, the evolution in this person, how are their needs going to evolve? Second, customization also requires the professionalization approach. And in this sense, different issues have to be tackled. On the guide, you will be able to read about it in much more depth. But I wanted to highlight the importance of something which also in the province of Gipuzkoa is essential for us. And it is what we call the professional model, professional reference. Then 
organizational dynamics in these organizations. They also need to evolve towards management models that make it possible to carry out this customization. More flexible organizations aimed at improving the quality of living of our users. We also want to highlight the physical, environmental and architectonic design of the premises. And uh, something essential here is the concept of disinstitutionalization, understood not as taking people out from institutions, but understood from the individualization of spaces. We need to help people to recover the control over their lives, to feel included within the society where they are. Fifth, we cannot forget regulations. We from public institutions, regulations that rule how the services operate. It also implies focusing on people living in these premises, these centers, and their characteristics. Like this, we will have a balance that will bear in mind common rights, individual rights, walking hand in hand with them and making people in the community where they live being co-responsible. Maybe social exclusion, this field, with criteria such as non-expulsion as something basic, is one of the areas where these changes are taking place, deep changes. Sixth, individual planning and intervention and daily activities daily activities and interventions, which are essential when we talk about customization. Mimetic and automatized activities will not be generating the motivation we need. Activities need to have four essential characteristics in terms of customization. They need to be significant for those people, empowering inclusive and based on daily activities for those people. Seven, participation, engagement, involvement of users, and also the involvement of the family members is essential too. Engagement in terms of being able to define their different plans involvement in the decision-making process concerning programs where they participate. And all this goes against the organizational dimension. We cannot lose sight of the fact that when we are talking about engagement and participation, we are talking about sharing power, yielding, giving power away. Power is something that makes us feel sure, secure, as if we are in power. When we talk about participation, we need to share power. That is essential too. Community resources and inclusion within community. We are talking about the use of community resources, not segregated along the lines of disinstitutionalization that I referred to before. Let's go to the community. Let's go out. We live in a society. We live within a community. And last, communication tools understood as guaranteeing, being able to guarantee access to information and transparency on organizations. But it has to be real and not just aesthetic. The fact we also analyze the limits and the obstacles to overcome when designing this customization process. We need to identify the limits, the limitations that we will find. That was also an exercise that we had to carry out. We identified limits in organizations. The goal of flexibility and adaptation to individual needs need to make this compatible to the organization. We need balance there. Economic limitations or limits, just as mighty, 
was telling us about when talking about sustainability. That is essential when we talk about economic resources and how to use them well. Administrative limits within the public sphere, when we talk about social services, these need to guarantee the rights of people, and this implies respecting certain procedures which very, very often, all too often, clash against the principles of customization. And we need to anticipate all that. We need to be conscious that the institutional inertia, organizational inertia, is going to be there all the time. And that is why we need to foresee them so as to minimize the problems when building this customization process. We also carried out another exercise concerning risks and benefits. And let me tell you now about the accelerators, which was a beautiful exercise that we carried out. Risks. We identified four main risks. The first of them is to develop a concept of customization based upon giving people responsibility concerning their social situation. Second, we carried out a different exercise focused on institutions. Yes, they have their own obligations, of course, but something that in the this is something developed in the Anglo-Saxon countries, and there is a lot of literature also contained here. The risk of uh, customization, understood as individualism, something that goes against acknowledging people as social beings. The importance of engaging the whole network, that significant network of support that we all have. We are not talking about individualism. No, it's not the same thing. And last, customization as because we cannot use this label as if just was a marketing tool. That is not the case. Those of us who have been creating and writing this guide, we hope that that won't be the case, that it won't just be a label. Which are the benefits that we have seen here? There are clear examples that show that the development of this theory is aimed at generating an important benefit. Benefits in people, users, also, if we take into account professionals and also organizations, of course, this cannot be done from one way to the other, as we said before, but it will be worthwhile. We also want to highlight that customization is something essential in ethical terms. As Marijo Goigochoa says, the ethic perspective asks from people to make decisions and to carry out different actions so as to generate the highest possible benefit. Within this framework, dignity is the essential ethical category. The maximum benefit of customization implies the empowerment of people becoming an essential part in terms of the decision-making process. After all, we are talking about improving our quality of living and support is essential to bioethics and the contribution that bioethics can make is also important. Yes, in terms of the principles of autonomy and justice. Well, the accelerators, that was something very important for all of us, defining those accelerators which are the elements that will be accelerating this transition, going to this new model based upon customization. Well, we carried out an exercise about which were the principles and the tools, but it is true that our conclusion on the guide is that there are five elements accelerating this transition, which are leadership and technical support, which is essential within this new framework. 
which also requires tools, we need a new toolkit to make this happen. Social demand, social requests coming from the mobilization capacity. Awareness raising is essential too. We need to awaken people and social movements have an essential role to play. And here in Gipuzkoa, we are a model. The political and institutional boost and support is essential. We need public policies that will be able to generate this change. Experimental projects also to promote the use of uh, scientific evidence, giving legitimacy to what we do. Fourth, professional engagement. We need technicians, we need experts, if we want to be able to use the right methods and obtain customization. In this Congress, where we have members of the academia, all the universities in the province of Gipuzkoa are here participating at this event. And I am sure that uh, you agree on the importance of this element. And fifth, the capacity to generate scientific evidence and also research and innovation approaches. And to finish, she goes back into Basque language, I would like to say thank you again. Thank you to all those who have made this guide possible. This guide will be available online through the Etorquizuna Eraikis website. Thank you, Javier Castro Espina. Thank you, a technician, coordinator of the think tank, main researcher in Sousi Nova, is now going to be telling us about the projects we have in the near future in terms of experimentation in Etorquis Unairaikis. Thank you very much. Good morning. I would like to start by thanking the International Committee here with all of us. In this debate about transitional social policies, and when we speak about customization and the transitions agenda, this is closely linked to the think tank, and that is why for me it is very important later on to know about your comments. What I am going to be introducing is very little, just uh, three images. And I would just like to tell you about our work within the think tank. How have we been working? First consideration, something interesting for us that we have been debating is the meaning, which is the approach that we want to give to this transitional social policies. We assume not a theory of change, but an approach focused on change. Just three main ideas. First of all, this implies a strategic level, identifying the problem from a shared perspective, but also from a future perspective. The idea is not just to see which are the problems today, but to think also with that future perspective. Second element linked to this transitional theory is the tactical level, the creation of alliances, partnerships. As Carlos has just said, there are three levels in social policies. First, contingencies, emergencies, social emergencies. Second, those policies aimed at stabilizing the different services and linked to quality of living. And the third level has to do with innovation, alliances so as to reach this stability and for innovation, they are different. And this is very important because from the tactical point of view within this theory, the most important thing is being able to build a new alliances system. And that is essential, as I said, because within our policies, transitional policies in Gipuzkoa, these new alliances 
are being built with workers, with managers and with users. That is a new way of constructing alliances. And it is very interesting to see how they get consolidated on the agenda, such as Carlos was telling us when talking about the Agenda 2030. All these different policies, budgets, actions and impacts within the agenda. The third level is the operational one, which insists on how do we implement this whole process. And it is here where we mobilize the actors, we promote projects and promote experimentation. There is a very important shift going from innovation to experimentation. And this is also linked to the fact of including the ethical dimension. We cannot experiment without having an ethical and ethics code. This is very important. Social experimentation is linked to ethics. Melen has already been speaking about it. We can speak about it later. Experimenting, experimentation, testing ideas, products and processes at the micro and small level so as to expand it later on. And fourth, I would like to talk about the assessment, the evaluation. We need to assess not only to know where we are in terms of this transition, but also to try and identify learning processes. What are we learning? We learned a lot when we assessed the COVID-19. We learned a lot about how we have to think these new policies. COVID-19, as we Oh, no, it was not just an epidemic, the whole system changed. And this is the interpretation that we also have within the think tank. In the, same, in the first session, we evaluated and assessed the COVID and its implications. If you want, we can keep on talking about this, this theory, but this is the basic idea. And there are four principles. First, collaborative governance. Second, the design of policies, the transition agenda, not only talking about social policies, but social policies promoting this transition in the model. And that is based upon experimentation as something basic for innovation. Because here the debate is always innovation is not just improving our quality of living. No, it is to promote a new model innovation that there are innovations aimed at improving for example our premises or our quality of living but they do not lead to transition so we establish this difference when we refer to innovations and then assessment once again we need to assess and evaluate and not only from the classical, I mean, in classical terms, we need to learn from that. An assessment makes it possible for us to learn. Okay, so very briefly, let me tell you about this new approach, about this new approach in terms of transitions. Okay, very quickly, let me tell you about what we have been doing in the think tank we have been referring to the what we did in the years 2021 there was 12 different sessions and we have obtained the white paper that is a very clear product obtained as well as this customization guide that belen has just explained so what comes next we think the think tank we want to strengthen experimentation. We want to launch a project which is quite complex. And we want to make this customization guide operational. Belen has been telling us about it. So now within the think tank, we want to implement all that and to have experimental projects so as to start creating and generating evidences based upon customization in social services. So the think tank won't just be a mere think tank, a deliberation space and a creation space to become an experimentation node. So now we want to make all this operational in terms of customization. 
second big strategy for the future within the think tank. We want to assess and see up to what point the recommendations coming from the white paper, up to what point can they become operational, operational within the Agenda 2030? Up to what point are they being integrated? Because the idea is not just to give recommendations from the think tank. We also want to be operational. Uh, we become an assessment node to assess social policies, understanding at to what point these recommendations, these 12 recommendations, are going to be developed and implemented. We need to know about that process, and that is why we will be using a method, a methodology, so as to be able to see the transition monitoring and how are we going to be monitoring this transition. To finish, I told you that this was going to be very brief. So what happens now? If tomorrow, if we decided to implement the 12 recommendations from the think tank, we would obtain a model, a completely different model in terms of care. It would be completely different. If tomorrow, if we were able to start implementing those 12 recommendations, the model would be different. Somehow, when we take a look at the recommendations and the customization guide, there is something radical there. There is a transformation, a radical transformation for the system. Now, the question is not just thinking in that way, but also being able to expand it and to escalate it. And this is the second stage. This has to become a do tank, the thing tank needs to become much more experimental in such a way as uh, becoming this assessment node. And there is something very important here that we are debating and thinking about is how to structure these assessments. We need to assess not only our quality of living and the social impact coming from these policies, but we also want to assess the transition. How are we changing the model? Up to what point do we have evidences showing that these policies are generating a new model? And that is not just as easy as that. We need to build indicators so as to be able to identify all that. So that is the task that we have ahead of us right now. We want to create and generate different nodes for evaluation. The Thintac is a node. We are inviting international European colleagues to come and work with us from the European perspective. We also have different agents, people, users, trade unions who are who also are part of this node. Therefore, this thing tank will become this uh, node, this network. How to assess will be key and essential within this transitional model. If we are not able to learn and assess, it will be very difficult for us to produce evidences about the impact that we are generating. So this was my introduction, this was my intervention. I think we are all a little bit tired. That is the idea. We have this transition approach. We have the theory, which is there. We can speak about it if you want. Theories that are above compared to experimentation. That is the field where we are. And uh, transition. Once again, we are going from one model to a different model based on users, based on people. That is the core. And that is the essential idea within our node in the think tank. This group of experts discussing social policies, you know, this is what we are doing. And that is all I wanted to share with you. But this is going to continue with this experimentation and with this assessment process. And in the 20 next minutes, I would like maybe to see if the committee has any questions, because we have this European Committee Commission integrated by five people, five
five people, five guests who are with us. So now the moment has come for them maybe to make comments or to ask questions about what we are doing. So that is what I propose right now. Those of us, Maite, Peña, Carlos, Belen and myself, maybe I would like to invite them to come up here and now the moment has come for experts to make their comments or to ask their questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. I apologize, we were getting all microphoned up here. And things change, uh, my perspective has changed by being up here, I was just saying that. We've got some questions from the committee. Firstly, thank you so much for inviting us here. My name is Victoria Stein. I'm from Austria. We've seen, uh, we've heard about all the work that you've done, the uh, effort that you've made, and you've got all the key words for the future. That's, more, uh, that's easier for me. I think a key challenge that I would like to pose to you reflects what Maite just said, switching perspectives. And I think it is very, um, yeah, it's, it, it signifies that actually Javier was the first one who said, and now we're going to include the people. And if you present what personalization means, what person-centered care means with a, um, from a committee of 10 experts without having the persons and the usuarios included, I think that's already showing something of you're not radical enough. So I think going forward, if you really want person-centered services, then you need to have the people included all the way and everywhere. But it may also mean that we actually need to think public administration, sectors and policies differently. Because it's still the perspective of social welfare. And you have the Organizaciones de Salud Integrada, 
already here. It's the health sector. It's integrated care from the health side. This was presented now as integrated care from the social side. But if we're talking about person-centered care, it shouldn't be the different systems thinking about their perspectives. We should actually look at the person and say, okay, how does one system support this person or this community or this family? And so when you're talking about pensar um, radical, then I think you need to also think about how can we actually experiment with a different organization of the system. Thank you. This question is, uh, is focuses on Carlos. <laughs> oh. More questions? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Okay. I'm Liva Fransen. I cannot speak Spanish, so I'm going to do it in English. <laughs> I'm a Belgian citizen and uh, worked for a long time in social policy in the European Commission. And I, I first would like to congratulate you because it is an enormous work that you have presented and that you have done. And it's really at the forefront of making social policies and social care work also in the future. But we should not forget that we should be proud about Europe having a social, social policy and social protection systems or social investment systems, which I prefer. And that you are at the forefront of making the transitions that are necessary so we can keep this kind of social protection system. That we don't have, I mean, I work worldwide, I can guarantee you that the countries that don't have a system like you have or that we have, uh, in India or in South Africa or in, in America had much more to suffer under the COVID epidemic than we all had. So we should keep that in mind because you are at the forefront of making that change that is important for all of us in, in Europe and all of us in the world actually. So I have a lot of questions though. One of the questions that I would like to ask is exactly related to how do you propose and I would like to understand a bit more how you propose to work with, with health and social. Because at a, at a certain stage, the person is one person. You want to personalize, well, and more and more health is done also through telehealth, for example, under COVID. So how is it possible in your institutional system? Because I don't really necessarily know how your healthcare system is similar. A second question I have, but I have, I'm only going to ask a second question, but I'm very much interested to know a little bit more about your indicators and your outcome or impact indicators. I would have liked to see a situation where you are now. So many people have this kind of institutional care, home care, or whatever. I mean, I would like to see the situation with people, not just processes, but so many people, and in, in so many years, you're going to change that how and with what kind of budget. I mean, you're talking about budget as if it's an, an afterthought, but your, in te your, your, your ambitions are very great but, and, and very important, but who is going to pay for that and how? I mean, for example, the carers. If you want to improve their, their, their situation, if you want to improve also the residential care, uh, how, who is going to pay for that and how? Did you have any uh, assessments or calculations on that or is that an afterthought? Thank you. That's two questions for me. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Adelina Comas Herrera. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us to take part in this very ambitious and stimulating uh, process. Congratulations, by the way, to the, 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 how far you've got so far. I'm going to ask a difficult question, and I know it's a difficult question. I'm aware of that. 
And it's a little bit related to what my companions have just asked you. Sometimes I'm, I feel that although you have radical ambition, I don't know if you can be even more radical because there are several issues related to governance and funding that haven't been treated. We seem to be accepting status quo, but it's a, a status quo that at a global level is being rethought. We're now rethinking how we should reorganize and fund these care systems, these uh, welfare systems. And although some of these issue, issues, such as the uh, Dependency Act, and I know you've got a, um, a role to play there in how to define these changes, but I'd like to know a little bit more about this. And my other uh, suggestion is that ambitions and this idea of going from a think tank to a do tank, I also think about an analyze tank. So, I mean, how can we maybe make a more visible and analytical side of things, um, a way of seeing whether this roadmap is being achieved. Uh, what are the indicators in that? What are the data, the information that we need to know whether we are improving the quality of life or reducing inequalities? How can we analyze this information? How, how can we know, how can we get the information to know whether we are we actually meeting these very ambitions? I don't know if uh, I need to say this now or later, but uh, by the way, congratulations. Muy buenos días, Egunon. Good morning, everybody. Firstly, congratulations as well. My name is Frances Toralba. I'm an ethics professor at the Roman EU University, and I chair five uh, care ethics committees. Congratulations for your work and for the possibility of being able to learn from this work. We read about your work before coming here, and we were guided uh, by Alfonso and the... Um, European Committee of Experts. My approach is an ethics-based approach. This is a, cropped up in a couple of uh, issues and it, it's included in this new care model. My question is how can we build the ethical infrastructures in this new care model to guarantee the uh, rights of all the involved stakeholders and also the obligations and the of the carers both at home or in residences because there are all sorts of uh, dilemmas being raised it's related to investigation research and next when we talk about researching and experimenting on human beings, on human beings that are members of vulnerable groups, uh, ethical requirements are really key. We need informed consent, convention, confidential, confidentiality. This requires um, ethical infrastructure, uh, ethics committee for social care or a scenario in the future where, as you said, there's going to be tremendous uh, cultural, linguistic and ethnical diversity that are going to begin, going to give rise to other ethical questions in the world of care because people come from different worlds. And if transition really is towards a customized um, approach and at home uh, care. It's really, really important about how these care, this care is offered at home so there's no more abuse, uh, rights violations, ill treatment, especially of the elderly happens at home. 
it's not normally at uh, care homes where there's more control. I say that because I support the idea of there being greater care at home, but we need to remember the rights of the rights of those who are caring and those who are being cared for. So I think there's a need to develop an ethics infrastructure. Perhaps me, this is the weakest link in what I've been able uh, to read quite carefully. By the way, thank you and congratulations. Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es... Good morning, my name is Beatriz Del Monte. I come from Public Tech Lab from the Instituto Empresa in Madrid. I'd like to say thanks, as uh, my other colleagues did, for having allowed us to take part in this situation. This is following on from what Francesca has just said, and it's related to ethics, but in this case it's related to experimenting. Throughout the whole of the presentation, you've spoken about how important experimentation is for innovation. I wanted to see, uh, I expected to see uh, more things that were broken. But when we talk about sustainability of this model that you're talking about, the idea of experimenting, it comes to a time when it needs to be opened up, to open to up to other kinds of dynamics. To what extent can platforms or facilitators be set up to, uh, so that you can not just have uh, experimentation, but also response to questions whether, so here you can see whether one approach is better than the other. Small steps are taken in during this experimentation, and this is required by organizations at Courage, and that call, uh, that requires a series of platforms to facilitate that being possible, especially when we include the sixth point, which you spoke about digital transformation, because there, when you talk about experimentation, this takes a, a new, a new uh, face, which uh, this actually came up. In, has this come up in your conversation? How do you approach this? I'd like to know. I'd like to know more about that. And congratulations for your work, by the way. Good morning, I'm Lucas Cortaza. I'm a researcher at TechPol and a consultant at the World Bank. Congratulations for all your work. Uh, the process that you've been through is incredibly valuable. And I know when you're talking about it, you're giving results. But I think it's also important to tell about the fact that the whole process has been very collaborative. There are uh, comments that are missing, but I think there's a very positive dimension here of how this process has been set up that involves so many agents and is shared. So in this sense, towards the future, we need to strengthen the value of the process and see whether we are able to communicate it, get the message across. This is a major Good morning, I'm Alfonso. I'm the direct, executive director of the European Social Network. Carlos Beren, Maite and others have asked me to set up this expert group, this international expert group. The provincial government is a member of our network in social uh, sectors. And I'd like to congratulate you first of all, because as uh, Libe has said, you've, you've put social welfare policies at the cutting edge of this uh, transformation process and learn, learning and transformation process. So I think from the outset, we should all be uh, happy that that is so, because it's not always the case. And I think this is the first thing that should be said. So I'm very proud, actually, that that is so. 
and also that it's been done from the public sector because once again this isn't something that's normally happens in the public sector so i was just wondering and i was asked actually by Sarah radio station about the value of this and i i highlighted that it's necessary for public authorities public administration to be at uh, the cutting edge of these policies so congratulations and carry on please however we're here you've asked us to help you you've asked us to give constructive criticism and i think that the diagnosis that you've uh, presented is a diagnosis that actually coincides with many of the things that are happening in many other countries so when mighty referred to the different population groups where we should really highlight our work, and I coincide with with the, the groups that she mentioned. But this, relating to one of the challenges, which was a demographic challenge that you mentioned, this need also to highlight immigration. Immigrants should also be in, included within these population groups because immigration could be framed positively, and that means. advancing towards this uh, demographic challenge, which is a major challenge for public administration, and combine it with the system's sustainability as well, encouraging this idea of an economy of care and the professional sector. Because it's true, there is a challenge here. And in the rest of Europe, which is related to how we it can encourage a greater professionalization of the system and how we can attract people into the system. How can we attract youngsters? How can we attract those people that have got a care experience? How can we attract immigrants? There, we've got a, the opportunity of uh, framing that positively, which at the same time may have a positive reflection on the demographic transition. So this is something maybe could be worked on. We coincide with your group, we coincide with this need that it, everything be people-centered. So if we've got thing, if we are people-centered, then we need to remember that. And when we talk about evaluation, not just process evaluation, but also results evaluation, the results are, are on the person. So when you talk about um, personalization or customization, we all agree with what you said when you talk about customization. And I think this is very closely related, not just to evaluation, but also quality. Quality sometimes is considered as like uh, the homologation of suppliers, of um, care homes, but actually it's a lot more than that. And it's closely related to care customization, care personalization. This is something that Francis mentioned, if we talk about uh, personalized care or h home care, we need to uh, understand quality from a different viewpoint because quality is a journey. What we understood as quality 10 years ago is not the way we understand quality today. And of course, we need to progress. And people, this idea of personalization and customization needs to be uh, very closely linked to quality in care and this is something that we need to think about when we uh, n we think about responding to the future challenges of the welfare state thank you so much for all these questions they're all very interesting they're all a challenge and maybe we can divide uh, our responses. I'll reply to the one about funding and uh, the healthcare atmosphere. It is I want to say that I agree with what you said about quality when you spoke about uh, quality. I think quality is closely, closely linked to personalization and customization. This is what we need to look at, the quality of the services and how the, this service quality can actually improve the quality of life of people. And those indicators that you mentioned, more uh, qualitative indicators are needed rather than quantitative and uh, necessary. It's really key. 
And I, this is, I feel, our goal, and that's what we're working in. As for immigration, it's true that uh, immigrants haven't been uh, set as one of our target populations because we've uh, linked our target populations to our services. And uh, immigrant uh, population isn't within these groups. It is true that we have uh, services that are specialized in uh, immigration, but it's true that we also, uh, this also forms a part of more macro policies that work on migration processes. And I think this is key uh, considering the aging of our population and the this uh, complete uh, change of the population pyramid, the complete reversal. You spoke about funding. Here, there are different sides to uh, funding. Of quite clearly, beyond the fact that, of course, there's going to be a greater need for funding, an increasing need uh, for funding. And this is, of course, due to population aging and the investment that needs to make, the, this tremendous investment that different departments need to make is huge. We, in the provincial government, almost 50% of the province's government is going to be spent almost 50% on social uh, care. And the thing is, we've got a very uh, complicated institutional setup that are like three levels here. You've got the, you've got the regional Basque government, the provincial governments, and the city councils. But in this mm, qualitative uh, uh, it, approach that we're taking, we don't start from scratch. It is true that there are um, economic benefits that are given uh, in the field of dependencies. There is home help, there are daycare centers. Each of these resources, these what we call them resources, are funded. Uh, but the leap that we want to take is to articulate all these different systems and articulate them so that they are... Mm, are able to be person-centered. And what we've uh, detected is that this is more expensive. At the outset, we're seeing that this is more expensive. Of course, at the end, you offer better uh, quality care, but it, it's more expensive. That isn't actually a problem per se. There's no, there's no problem with the sustainability of our proposal. The sustainability of social services is something that is predates all of that. And in fact, we raised this issue in the previous uh, period of government. Who has to pay for this? Uh, how is it? Uh, how should it be paid for? To what degree uh, should it be funded by the youth themselves? What about co-payment? How can we use taxation to assist in this idea of uh, co-payment? But this is a more macro level um, debate. We can't wait for that to be solved because there is many, many complications and we still can't see a short-term solution. What can we do? Well, what we can do is what we are doing. Uh, we've already um, set up in the previous uh, give government period in office, and this is uh, this one is actually ratifying what we've do done. We've started about we started with our pilot projects that have funded. Initially, it was just provincial funding, and these have been giving results. So it's thanks to you, this idea of collaborative governance, and that that is behind everything that we do. Why do I say that? because we, uh, institutions, are prepared to invest more, undoubtedly. We shouldn't forget that, of course, we can't have all of the province's uh, budget being spent on social and healthcare services. But actually, when we, our experience has shown us that when we work with institutions, for example, primary healthcare institutions and others, if behind the experimental uh, project that requires great investment, to, provided there's an improvement in quality, then people are prepared to invest more. And we've actually made a um, huge leap forward We've uh, set up a network, thanks to our collaboration with the third sector, of uh, 
innovation experimentation, which we are all, uh, we've all taken on board. I think the fact that we've reached these conclusions together, together with different uh, councils, is really, really basic, really important for us. For us, councils, town councils are key. The rest will come over time, but what we are clear on is that we can't just sit and wait and sit and wait for funding solutions to appear on the horizon or for funding to be clarified or for measures that can be uh, set up to, to start doing things. We can't wait for that. We need to start doing it. I gave the example of the local care ecosystems because I think it's really, really interesting, interesting how at a micro level in the healthcare field, we are able to articulate different systems around a person's needs and how at a micro level the evaluations that are uh, made really do make up for the investment that's made. The, we've got uh, ha health care areas where we uh, debate. There are um, uh, provincial councils. We've got uh, uh, health care uh, governance, in theory, very, very well articulated. What we're lacking sometimes is practice. We're lacking um, for... Uh, practical coordination at a personal level and this but actually uh, this is our experience anyway but this we we do get better at a micro level when you're in a little neighborhood in a little town that's where we are obtaining excellent results and it may well be via uh, showing the results that we're able uh, to achieve we can perhaps attack to th attract different stakeholders to this way of working we feel that so far with the rules of the game that we've set out for ourselves and um, where we don't have uh, the possibility of uh, changing them we're, we're hoping that this will happen and um, collaborative uh, governance in healthcare but not just in healthcare We, what we want to do is to get these projects right down to your your own uh, um, GPs, surgery, where you can really get the coordination from the different systems. It's far more complicated when we talk about mainstreaming in it. It's not, for example, mainstreaming it into housing. Housing isn't necessarily something that should come into uh, social services, but we do need to help people that are in housing and the same goes for education these are roadmaps that we're following with these three systems it's different with the different institutions it's also difficult but if we link what we've learned to uh, the users of our services at a micro level we're getting good results well, I am going to try and reply to some of the comments or questions. You were talking about how important it is to have the users on board and to listen to them. That's what we try and do. Whenever we create a pilot project, then we have been assessing whether that intervention has improved the quality of living of users or not. And up to this moment, that has always been the case. The intervention has always improved their quality of living. And also, we have carried out a cost effectiveness analysis. The idea is to be able to show how in the long term, that is also an investment because we are reducing social expenditure elsewhere. Indicators, yes, indicators are important in terms of the agenda when we say that care at home is important. We have been trying to see if the rate today represents 80% at home, the challenge is to reach 87% by the year 2030, care being provided at home. Or when we say that we want to desinstitutionalize this care provided, we say 
by the year 2023 or 2030, let's try and make it possible that 10% of all the, uh, that is to improve this by 10%. Once you will get to know better about the project, assessment is not just marketing. No, it is essential for us in terms of learning. And for us, it is essential beyond terms and words, we want to reach those objectives. Something that worries us is uh, home care, care being provided at home. And we have carried out 8,000, 10,000 inspections at home because we have an agreement with city councils. And it is true that in certain cases, in a very low percentage, the care being provided was not good and we have tried to improve it. That is an issue for us. That is very important. And to try and reply to Alfonso, maybe they have not been included as a specific group, but on the agenda, you will see that there are many actions aimed at promoting the engagement of people through co-ops with a specific conventions, just how we, want, how we want to engage, for example, migrants too. Yes, mm. cooperatives, of course, they focus on these people. Let me try and give you an example about a local ecosystem of care. We have difficulties with the microphone. Let me try and give you an example. We have an ecosystem in Pasaya, this municipality in the province in Gipuzkoa, and there we're implementing a collaborative governance process where we have a group within this pilot project integrated by the Department of Health, the Department of, of Social Health, Social Policies, and the City Council, and Adimberri, which focuses on healthy aging. Within this process, this uh, committee is already, has already integrated the four or five key elements linked to the local approach. That is the first element. Within that ecosystem, there are five or six projects which are experimental projects working to try and integrate people, engage people within the care process. Sorry, we have difficulties with the microphone once again. How to work with families, with carers, and also how to develop different tools, tools linked to this pathway or itinerary of uh, care. And we are talking about different services. We are creating a tool so as to be able to manage those different roadmaps or itineraries of services that we need. At the same time, in three months time, we're going to launch a digital platform based upon data governance. We are working with an interoperability system, interoperability between the social services, health services, GP surgeons, and the projects and intervention. So th this digital platform proposes three key things. First, how to capture significant information coming from the system and how to include it within that digital platform, Link linking that to protection of personal data and the interoperability of data. We have the platform. The second function of this digital platform is to monitor and create the impact measurement tools. And third, as we said before, how to communicate all that? How are we going to be informing about it when we talk to users, final users, and also the people by and large in the province. Communication is essential. Communicating is key. Fourth element in terms of this local ecosystem in Pasaya, the learning network. 
what we are doing is to generate this network to try and transfer these experiences into other munici municipalities in Gipuzkoa. Yes, scalability is important. We need to be able to learn from experiences and to do that, we also have a digital platform. So we are already integrating the digital dimension within our local ecosystems. We are also, we also have a problem, the name of which is Betty On from the Basque government, focusing on daycare services at home. That is also being integrated within the platform. So the digital aspects are already there within this transformation process. And we have experts working in terms of data and data interoperability, which is something key in this process when developing these digital platforms. That is a pilot experience that we are developing right now. Well, I think that we are running out of time, but I would like to go back to two questions we haven't replied to. And maybe that will be the end of the session this morning, if you all agree. Thank you so much, Frances, for your intervention. That is what I would like to speak about, ethics. In Gipuzkoa, as you know, we have a committee, an assistential ethics or ethical committee. And yes, I agree with you. This is something key. This is essential, not only in terms of personalization, but customization and uh, care provision. Thank you for your intervention. It is true that, you know, it is essential not to forget about it. And something which is important too, that I would like to underline, is that the social services system cannot do just absolutely everything for migrants, for housing, no we have to be much more focused. And it is true that sometimes it is confusing. The role of ours ends up being quite confusing. And sometimes we accept responsibilities that are not for us to tackle and to take care of. Well, maybe we have a coordination role to play. That is true. She was also talking about that coordination perspective with housing and with other departments, but that was a final note. It is true that we cannot forget about that. Doubts. Well, we could have so many doubts, but thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution and for your presence. I think, yes, we are absolutely out of time. Thank you, Eskari Casco in Basque. Thank you for your attention.